And Justin, how much of Catherine's voice comes from the book that the series was based on and how much comes from you in the writer's room? Um, I would say that the tone, I, I really admire the book. It's a wonderful piece of history. It's brilliantly researched. And I think there's a wit to it, but it's quite subtle. And I think that, so most of Catherine's voice is my invention because I, I wanted to do a villain from history and give her a chance to make her day in court. Um, and I found it in Catherine. Do you really consider her a villain? I think she is considered a villain. I think she's considered responsible for the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre, which killed, I think, more people in the French Revolution. And um, she's considered a poisoner. She's considered a manipulator. That, you know, she dressed all in black. That's her image. I don't consider her a, a, a uh, I think the book considers her with greater, with real sympathy. I consider her um, a sort of, somebody I find very sympathetic who is capable of acts of evil to survive. And before I move on to Erwin, I do have several questions for you too. Now that you said that, Justin, is that why it makes sense to tell her story um, both young and older so that you get that sympathetic angle? I think so. Look, I think what I found in Catherine was an anti-hero, right? Uh, a true anti-hero, somebody we could root for, somebody who we, would, who we want to survive, and then also to really wonder what they're capable of doing, how far they'll go. Uh, and I couldn't think of a female anti-hero, but I think that it's essential to tell the story um, and to dramatize how young she was when she was plucked out of that orphanage and mm -hmm. dropped in France. Her survival depended on her negotiation of this world of vipers that was the French court. And then to have to consummate her marriage in front of everybody in front of including her uncle, every teenager's worst nightmare, right? I have two teenagers, worst nightmare. Um, and to fully invest you with the sympathy and have every move, if she doesn't get it right, she's she's not gonna survive. And then to see from there, um, how long she ruled, how many kings she outlived, uh, how she continued to, to outmaneuver all the men around her. I thought it was essential, yes, to see that young, innocent girl. And, and also to see how despite all her political maneuvering, how she's somebody who in, in many ways was defined by heartbreak. She fell in love with the guy she was arranged for and he didn't love her back. And Erwin, why do you think Catherine deserves this rich series treatment at this point in history? Uh, there's something incredibly contemporary about her. Um, it's especially, especially given the moment in history that we find ourselves in now, vis-a-vis um, -vis women in power. Uh, when I first came into this business, which was in the 80s, it was a very, very different world. Uh, there were no women, there was not a woman that had a job that could green light a television series or a movie. So every woman who worked at that time, um, her job was to serve it up to the men who had the power to in fact do that. And what you would often hear at that time is, well, so-and-so has really sharp elbows. So-and-so is really conniving, um, et cetera, et cetera. And I always thought, oh my God, what a just, what a tough place to be is to be as talented, if not more talented, but because of your gender, um, you're really not in a position to do the very things that your talent um, equips you to do. And so I think it's a very, very con a contemporary story as to when that, when a woman, when somebody comes up against that, how that kind of perverts somebody and how easily, it, how easy it becomes to be perceived as a villain because of the things she has to do to survive. And hey, we're still going through that today, just so you know. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It really but stinks. At least today there's a, <laughs> we are going through it today, but at least today there's an awareness that we're going through it. When I first came Good into point. the business, there wasn't even an awareness that there was, at least today, the idea of an inequity exists. 40 years ago, the idea that an inequity exists 
didn't even exist. <laughs> that makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Justin, what were the challenges that you faced kind of creating the two separate characters, the early Catherine and the mature Catherine, if we'll call her that, well, and, and, and spreading the wealth of her personality really between those two time periods? Well, the, the challenge, as I said, the challenges were the breadth of time we had to do because um, you needed to see the challenges Catherine overcame, the triumphs about maneuvering these people, and then the unspeakable tragedy. I mean, she had 10 children and outlived only one of them. I mean, that's like a fairy tale curse. Um, and as you know, Catherine, you know, many people consider her the basis of the evil queen in Snow White. You know, she had a magic mirror, she had a poison apple, uh, which is in the show. Um, but this is not a magical show. This is a show about real people. And um, so the challenges were, it, it was very clear to me though, that the shape of the show, that the first three episodes will be played by one actor, but because the central um, uh, challenge is that until she's pregnant, she's not safe, right? That's her, I mean, talk about a glass ceiling, talk about demeaning, her purpose is to produce an heir, right? Uh, and if she does, I mean, talk about consent or privilege. I mean, where's consent in this world, right? But as soon as she gets pregnant, and in order to get pregnant, she she crosses a major uh, moral line to do it. Um, then I thought she was into a different set of challenges, and that was the transition um, for for to go to the older uh, Catherine, and and specifically because. Um, as I said, it was so important to dramatize how young this person was when her sole purpose was to create an heir for this court. Um, but when you do that, the central challenge is, I often feel that when a show or movie changes actors, I bonded with the old actor and, and I don't wanna let them go. Um, so that was paramount in my mind. And um, while this is a world all about manipulation, and why I wanted to do a direct address, though not a direct address to the to the audience, but a direct address where we know specifically to whom she's talking, uh, and and therefore to dramatize this is an act of manipulation, even the story she's telling. That was a way to bring Samantha into the show, so you bonded with both actors, and I and I really liked you know direct address is something that's been around since ancient Greece and and, and Shakespeare etc. But I really liked this soup of hearing Samantha's voice, older Catherine's voice in moments of voiceover in the same scene that young Catherine Lib would turn to the camera and say something. And they're both directed at Rahima, uh, who's listening to this story. And I thought that that was a really interesting soup, an interesting way to do memory, to create the idea of a story that could be trustworthy and could not be. Um, so those are the challenges and also the opportunities, if that answers the question. It does. And uh, thank you so much for talking to me today. This show turned out far better than I ever imagined. It's, it was a real delight. Thank you so much.